Welcome back to Better Off Ball, the life in 147 days. I am your host and storyteller, Andrea Wilson-Woods. Whether you're watching the video or listening to the podcast, I really appreciate you tuning in. And if you have made it this far with me, you have discovered two things. Number one, I have not held anything back when it comes to the reality of cancer. It is not pretty or sexy. And number two, my sister Adrian was one of the most amazing people in the whole world. And I hope through this story, you have really gotten to know her. Let's get started. Days 142 through 144, Thursday through Saturday, October 4th through the 6th, 2001, one smiley face, i.e. bowel movement. In recent hours, I have loved, check, ate, check, slept, check, died. A doodle by Adrian, no date. Our living room resembles a nuclear power plant. Three tall cylindrical steel tanks containing oxygen stand against the back wall next to the television set. Each holds 12 hours of compressed oxygen. The Continental Hospital Supply Company will deliver three new tanks every 36 hours. I have already memorized their phone number in case there's a problem. With a height of 54 inches and a diameter of 8.5 inches, the tanks are not very portable. Thin tubing from one tank runs along the carpet, across the hallway, and into Adrian's bedroom where it connects to her oxygen mask. I set an alarm to remind me when I need to switch the tubing to the next tank. I shoo Adrian's kitten, Marinol, away when he plays with the tubing. I call American Home Health to ask someone how to administer the IV fluid. John and I gave Adrian almost one liter last night before the IV stopped working. We must have done something wrong. The box of supplies that arrived at our door last night didn't come with instructions. When I explain to the woman what happened, she chastises me for attempting to give the fluid without speaking to someone first. I defend myself by saying the discharge orders state, give one liter of fluid via IV over eight to 10 hours a night, but the stranger on the phone doesn't care. She acts as though I've done permanent damage by overhydrating Adrian. You were supposed to start tonight, she says, because Adrian was well hydrated after leaving the hospital. No one told us that. How were we supposed to know to start on Thursday? The woman sighs and asks, How do her ankles look? Adrian is drinking apple juice and watching TV. I inspect her ankles. They are puffy. Great. Um, they're swollen. Uh-huh. Skip the IV fluid tonight. Call tomorrow if the swelling doesn't go down. Elevate her legs at all times. Start the fluid again tomorrow night. Do you understand? I grit my teeth. I remind myself this woman is only doing her job. Yes, thank you. I hang up the phone and explain to Adrian how John and I gave her too much fluid. She shrugs and removes her mask. Am I going to pee a lot? She asks with one eyebrow cocked. I smile, but I don't laugh. Yeah, kiddo, probably. Okay. Hey guys, it's Adrian. Mm. If you want updates on how I'm doing, please call my sister's voicemail at 213-941-0617. And I'm sorry I haven't been returning messages, but I'm really either too busy or too tired to get on the phone, so yeah. And for those of you who know my website, I usually update that. But if not, then just call the number. Thank you, bye. After listening to Adrian's outgoing answering machine message, a high school friend of hers, Mick, calls me. Even though he never visited her in the hospital and she hasn't talked to him all summer, I return his call because he sounds worried and I always liked him. The first time I met Mick was when Adrian and I ran into him at the local Sears store at the Burbank Mall earlier this year. Adrian had done a presentation at school that day. She had twisted her blue hair up into a knot for the occasion, which made her appear older and elegant. I could tell from Mick's body language how much he liked Adrian. His quick glances, his broad smile, 
and his witty jokes were a direct response to his interaction with her. After he left, I said something to Adrian, but she blew me off. Right, sissy. He's just a friend. He's just a friend meant she didn't think he was boyfriend material. However, I know Adrian likes Mick, so I speak to him and then relay the conversation to Adrian. According to Mick, he called Adrian's answering machine many times during the summer. What frightened him was how young Adrian sounded in her outgoing message. She didn't sound like herself, he said. What does he expect? Adrian responds. I have cancer. A slight sarcasm in her voice tells me she's disappointed he waited so long to call her. I'm not sure he left messages those other times. I didn't tell Mick what I told the producer from the Montel Williams show, even though my point is the same. You waited too long. You should have called sooner. Adrian can't, or in this case, won't see you now. Through Sophia's connections at the NIH, she has found a clinical trial for Adrian. Located in San Mateo, California, Cyclone Pharmaceuticals makes Cadaxin, the trade name for Thymosin Alpha-1. The company will allow us to have the drug without charge and they will ship the medication to our house. Adrian is sort of a one-woman clinical trial since Cadaxin is meant to treat hepatitis. Its efficacy on liver cancer is unknown. Previously unenthusiastic about this drug, Dr. Quino agrees to oversee and track the results since Cadaxin cannot hurt Adrian. Cyclone promises to push the paperwork through with the FDA as fast as possible. I believe they have to file for compassionate use. Sophia, Dr. Quino, and a Cyclone representative reiterate to me Cadaxin is not a cure. It is another type of immunotherapy drug, and Adrian may have the same reaction to it as she did to interferon. Nothing they say can quell my renewed faith that maybe a miracle can happen. Even if it only slows down the tumor's growth, Cadaxin could buy us more time to find a cure. Like a piece of driftwood in a vast ocean, I cling to this drug. Help Adrian Cadaxon. You're her only hope. What do you want to be for Halloween this year, kiddo? Adrian smiles and then shakes her head. I don't know. Something different. I thought bringing up her favorite holiday might cheer her up, but she didn't take off the mask when she answered my question. Talking takes too much effort, but I can see from her fuddled brow she is thinking about her costume now. Adrian's first Halloween in Los Angeles was quite memorable. On that cold, wet night in 1995, we walked through puddles and mud as torrents of rain poured down on us. Shivering, we continued trick-or-treating in Beverly Hills, determined to get the best candy possible. However, many people were not home. Maybe the rich have better things to do on Halloween than sitting around waiting to give out candy to children. I guess they go to parties. Dressed as a dead prom queen, with pale makeup on her face and fake blood splattered across her pink formal dress, wearing a sash that read Prom Queen 1985, Adrian was disappointed no one got her costume. Door after door, people laughed at her and said, Oh, look, it's Carrie! I explained to Adrian that Carrie, a scary prom queen with telekinetic powers, was a fictional character from a book. But until I let her read the Stephen King novel for herself many years later, she didn't think anyone understood her Halloween costume that year. Looking older than her 10 years, Adrian became Cleopatra for our first and only Halloween with John's son Adam, who had to be the world's smallest Incredible Hulk. Covered in green body paint and wearing torn clothes, four-year-old Adam growled instead of saying trick-or-treat at each door. John, Adrian, and I pretended to be scared, but stifling our laughter was difficult, especially when a neighbor thought Adam was an elf. I remember spotting a dead cat in the street, and John and I turned the kids away before they could see it. We had only known each other two months, but the four of us already felt like a family. Adrian and I began our pumpkin carving tradition that year. She created the designs, and I carved the pumpkins. We made our pumpkins look like characters from the cartoon Space Monkeys because Anya worked on the show. Adrian and Adam loved it. Without Adam the following year, John and I stayed home while Adrian went trick-or-treating with a new friend from middle school. Adrian returned to being as dark and scary as possible on Halloween. 
She resurrected the dead prom queen costume, but this time she wore a different dress, less blood, and added a fake bullet on her forehead for more dramatic flair. John and I threw a Halloween party in 1998, and we allowed Adrian to invite her friends. I dressed as Scully from the TV show The X-Files, and as usual, John refused to wear a costume because it's stupid. Adrian found a weird, witchy outfit in a Halloween shop, so she donned black and purple for the occasion. Our South Park pumpkins were a big hit at the party, especially the fat one we picked out for the character Cartman. Dressed in a black gown with a hood, Adrian transformed herself into the Grim Reaper for the next Halloween. She even wore the costume to school that day. I didn't know whether to be happy she was covered from head to toe or to be worried she seemed attracted to death. She had only been in therapy with Diana for one year, but I thought making a big deal about it was the worst thing to do. All I said was, it's a little dark, don't you think? Which prompted an immediate eye roll from Adrian. Throughout that year, however, Adrian sometimes called herself Persephone, a reference to the Greek goddess of the underworld. But then again, she often gave herself nicknames. In elementary school, she was Adrian Cherry Wilson, a tribute to the pink ladies in the film Grease. Her live journal name is Zio, and she will sign things Dazzled Zio. She even named her hamster Ziola. Anyway, I work hard at letting her have her own space because I know what a control freak I am. Regarding the Halloween costumes, I don't think I have anything to worry about because last year, Adrian dressed as herself. On Friday, I could not get Adrian to eat much. A cracker here, a bite of toast there, but she drinks water, apple juice, and grape soda. I forget to keep track of the exact amount of ounces she is drinking because a more pressing matter has arisen. Adrian's urine turns sunset orange, which could be the result of jaundice or possible dehydration. The home health care nurse on the phone, a nicer woman this time, recommends starting Adrian back on the IV fluids tonight, even though her ankles are still swollen. After taking her first bath in days, Adrian lies down in her bed in our new home, and I hook up the IV, which will dispense one liter of fluid over 10 hours. I place one of the baby monitors, Anya and Alex bought us, on one of the built-in shelves above Adrian's bed. She hates the idea we need to listen to her sleep, but we should have gotten the monitors a long time ago in case something happens in the middle of the night. For example, with all the IV fluid dripping into her body, Adrian will need my assistance if she has to go to the bathroom, even though her bed is 10 steps away from the toilet. She hasn't had a bowel movement in days, but since she is hardly ingesting solid food, that's to be expected. I take the other baby monitor into our bedroom, which is full of unpacked boxes, and put it on my nightstand. I turn it on, and the quiet static lulls me to sleep. I stare at the parking ticket on the kitchen table. While we were at UCLA for three days, my car was parked on the wrong side of the street during the city's weekly street cleaning, something we never had to worry about at our old house because we had a driveway. I doubt I will ever forget on Wednesdays from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. I cannot park on the opposite side of the street. I will remember because the date on the $35 parking ticket marks the day Adrian came home on oxygen. Receiving the ticket is a nuisance, but it doesn't bother me like it would have before. Paying the fine means nothing. I used to think having loads of money would make me successful and thus happy. How foolish of me. However, wealth does buy freedom and access, according to Warren Beatty. As I apply Neosporin to Adrian's recent bed sore, I think how money cannot make her well. It could give us access to other drugs and the freedom to fly to other countries, but wealth in and of itself is no guarantee of good health. When I was a kid, I read this book about a young boy who wished for all the money in the world, but in doing so, he caused other nations to go bankrupt. Soon he discovered he couldn't spend or give the money back. As bills and coins piled up on his family's property and the world economy collapsed, he had to figure out how to outsmart the leprechaun who granted his foolish wish. I remember thinking how if the boy had phrased his wish differently, things would have turned out okay. I understood the point the book was making. 
but I ignored it. Now 29 years old, rubbing lotion on Adrian's arms and legs as she lies in bed, half asleep, dependent on oxygen, I get it. The publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes could knock on our door right now, and I would tell them to go away. Cancer doesn't respond to cash. By Saturday afternoon, Adrian's ankles almost looked normal, keeping them elevated alleviated the swelling. From sunset to maize, the color of her urine has improved, so I believe she is more hydrated, although I cannot be sure. However, after checking her vital signs, I discover her temperature is 100.5 degrees. 500 milligrams of Tylenol and 90 minutes later, her fever climbs to 101, but after 20 minutes, it drops down to 100.5. Despite the descent, I call UCLA and the doctor on call urges us to go to St. Joe's ER right away for a blood culture, a CBC, and a urine analysis. At the time when most people are sitting down to dinner, John and I are rushing Adrian to the hospital. Her body remains warm, and although she appears lethargic, Adrian knows where she is as she lies on a gurney in the ER. Urgency runs like a current through the air as more than one doctor treats Adrian. She has never received this amount of attention before. Though I notice Adrian's short gasp as she breathes, I do not count how many breaths she is taking. When a doctor informs us her oxygen intake has dropped to 93% with the mask on and her respiratory rate is less than 10 breaths per minute, I listen for the time between each breath. <sighs> One, two, three, four, five, six. Each hollow inhale is followed by a quick exhale. <sighs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <sighs> I feel like I'm in two dimensions, a slow, spacey one where time stops until I hear Adrian breathe again, and a fast, blurry one where people connect tubes, draw blood, and run tests while machines beep hum and shudder. I look on the monitor and see Adrian's blood pressure is 90 over 50. It's never been that low. Mine once dropped to 80 over 50 after my emergency appendectomy and even though I felt okay, my surgeon was worried. Not wanting to disturb Adrian, a nurse takes her temperature under her armpit. The result is 101.5 degrees. She shakes her head and runs to get the doctor. When the nurse returns, I ask her to explain the difference between readings under the armpit versus in the mouth. She says the auxiliary result is typically 0.5 degrees lower than the mouth's temperature, which is a more accurate representation of the body's heat level. To be sure, she removes the oxygen mask and coaxes a thermometer into Adrian's mouth. Adrian's fever has risen to 102.3 degrees. Within an hour, the doctor lowers Adrian's body temperature to 101.5 by giving her medication through her central line. Finally, the doctor has test results that explain why Adrian's body fell apart. The chest x-ray is inconclusive. The doctors cannot read it because of the numerous tumors. I didn't want them to waste their time doing the x-ray, but I knew they had to rule out pneumonia. Adrian's CBC looks good, except she's anemic. So far, these results are normal for her. The urine analysis, however, shows Adrian has a serious urinary tract infection. Damn it, those bright colors. I tell the doctor about the last two days and hear myself saying, she has never had a UTI before. The results from the blood culture are not back yet, but Adrian's blood sugar has dropped to 19, when the normal range is 70 to 110. After giving her dextrose, essentially sugar, in her IV, the doctor raises Adrian's sugar level to 147, too high, but he seems to prefer it that way. Concerned about Adrian's breathing, the doctor introduces a test I've never heard of, a blood gas. It analyzes the pH, carbon dioxide, PCO, and oxygen, PO, concentration levels in the blood. Adrian's pH is 7.1, which is on the low side considering the range 
is 7.35 to 7.45. I don't need to know what the norms are when the doctor says Adrian's PCO is 80 and her PO is 70. I understand her blood has more carbon dioxide than oxygen. She can't sustain that much longer, but no one offers a solution. Instead, the staff expresses their concern about her pain level. Adrian missed her 8 p.m. dose of methadone. After reviewing her medical records, the ER doctor in charge decides giving Adrian two milligrams of Dilaudid through her IV makes more sense than having her swallow a pill. I agree, except two milligrams intravenously seems excessive, but I can't remember how much that would translate into pill form, so I can't be sure. Hell, I can't remember the last time I ate. Therefore, I don't trust my memory regarding the milligram conversion. I never ask why methadone, her new pain medication, is not an option. As Adrian drifts off to sleep, John urges me to get a Diet Coke. He sees I'm fading. I go to the lobby where the vending machines are and find Anya and Alex, who have been there for hours, waiting for an update on Adrian. I remember calling them. Or did John call? I don't think either one of us ever came out here to see if they were here. I recall everything that's happened, especially the numbers. Blood pressure, blood sugar, respiratory rate, pH, and oxygen are too low. Carbon dioxide and body temperature are too high. Oh, and now the blood sugar too, but don't worry about it. What else? Oh, Adrian has a UTI and she is resting after they gave her Dilaudid. Anya and Alex promised to stay there as long as we need them. And then they push me toward the double doors where a nightmare awaits. The doctors don't use words such as overdose or coma. Instead, they tell John and me they might have given Adrian too much Dilaudid more than her body can handle. Even though the dosage seemed high to me, Adrian appears to be in a deep sleep, nothing more. I don't think they did anything wrong, but their creased brows and strained faces tell me they believe otherwise. To cover their asses, they want to wake Adrian up by reversing the effects of all opiates in her system with a drug called Narcan. I don't know why Narcan sounds familiar to me, our mother never undid the drugs she ingested. Maybe I heard about it on television or in the movies. In the film Pulp Fiction, John Travolta plunges a syringe into Uma Thurman's chest to save her from a heroin overdose. Was he injecting Narcan into her body? Of course, these thoughts flit through my mind in mere seconds, but I don't say them aloud. I listen as the doctors caution us. Any pain medication Adrian has received will be neutralized, and she will probably have a strong reaction to Narcan. Most people do. Despite their warning, I am not prepared for what happens next. Ah! Adrian pops up like a jack-in-the-box. Her shrieks are coherent despite the mask. Thrashing her thin arms in midair, she pushes doctors and nurses away as they grab her limbs. She spots John and me. Sissy, stop. Make, stop, she yells. Oh my God, what have they done? You have to give her something for the pain. Now, the doctor nods. We will. We have to calm her down first. She's just scared and confused. Goddamn asshole, she's alive. You didn't kill her. Instead, you're torturing her. Now lying down, her limbs at her side, but still raising her voice, Adrian cries out, Bathroom! Have to go now! I look at the nurses and then the doctors. I realize no one thinks she should get out of bed. She's going to be humiliated. I show Adrian the bedpan. Okay, sweetie, we're going to slide this underneath you and you try to go, okay? Adrian nods, but after a few minutes, she can't or won't go. I remove the bedpan. Forget it, I tell the nurses. Underneath that oxygen mask, through the yellow glaze of her eyes, and despite the wet face of frustrated tears, I see my Adrian, stubborn, strong, and still fighting. I squeeze one hand. John squeezes the other. What now, I ask. The doctor gives Adrian Haldol to decrease her anxiety, and she soon falls back into a sound sleep. Up down, riding the seesaw, 
finding that perfect balance seems to have eluded this doctor. I don't blame him, but I regret putting Adrian through the Narcan nightmare because it wasn't necessary. I tell myself Adrian is getting some much needed rest. However, my shoulders tighten as the seconds go by between Adrian's breaths until they relax when I hear her exhale, only to tighten again. The St. Joe's staff recommends Adrian be transferred to UCLA as soon as possible so her regular doctors can monitor her care. In the meantime, the doctor orders two strong antibiotics to fight the UTI. Nurses continue to monitor Adrian's vital signs, and by midnight, her temperature is 101 degrees. Another blood gas shows Adrian's blood sugar remains high at 143, but her PCO has dropped to 44, a vast improvement, and now within normal range. Her pH level is still low though. An hour later, Adrian's fever drops to 100.7 degrees, so the antibiotics must be helping. However, her blood sugar rises to 156 and her PCO increases to 52. I write the numbers down, feeling with every step forward, we take two steps backward. What's worse, a high fever or high carbon dioxide? The answer, neither is worse. They both suck. John and I wait and watch in silence, except when we talk to Adrian. The transfer is delayed because UCLA decides Adrian needs a special cardiac pediatric care team to escort her to the hospital. They are sending over their own people, one doctor, two nurses, and another specialist. The ambulance with the team arrives around 3.30 a.m. They speak in hushed tones with St. Joe's ER doctors. I don't understand their somber faces with sympathy oozing out of their pores. As I climb into the ambulance to ride with Adrian, I get it. No one thinks she's going to make it across town. They don't know my Adrian. Thank you for watching and listening to Better Off Bald, A Life in 147 Days. Please subscribe to my channel and stay tuned for the next episode.